uh, today's workshop uh, will be about computer vision application and uh, why we choose uh, to deliver workshop about computer vision. Uh, current lockdown kind of push people uh, from other fields to help doctors and others who fight against coronavirus somehow and uh, we decided to make our kind of uh, attempt and share to help them somehow. And uh, this workshop will be about to build uh, a computer vision application which we will be uh, able to detect uh, if a person uh, wears face mask or not. And this will happen in uh, real time, I mean the in real video stream. Uh, so that's kind of all about us. And uh, let's proceed with this small outline of this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, here is it. And uh, there, as you see, there are some parts of this workshop. Uh, in the first part, we briefly uh, talk about uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, how they are work and how it helps uh, us to uh, deliver our best results uh, in computer vision tasks. And after that, we will talk about how we generate and collect data and then uh, model architecture, which model architecture, which uh, I mean, which uh, neural network we chose and why we chose that particular model architecture and how we build and train the model. And after that, as natural comes the uh, performance evaluation of the model, how it generalizes on the uh, outside the training data. And uh, at the very last part of our uh, workshop, we will have some coding and uh, where we will uh, see how our application is deployed on real time videos and how it performs and how it detects if the person wears a face mask, mask or not. Uh, so. uh, sorry, no, that I put the link uh, of the like GitHub repository so you can uh, uh, get on the project. Uh, oh, thanks. So, so here is the, uh, and I can provide you all with uh, the link. How can I get this? Uh, uh, I put it in the chat. Ah, okay, thanks. Okay. And you can clone this repo and you can follow me uh, with this uh, structure. It's a very simple one. So let's continue. Oh, sorry, where is this? And uh, uh, let's briefly uh, talk about uh, uh, what is the, what are the convolutional neural networks and how they work. Uh, <clears throat> When we have general, when we have uh, some computer vision tasks, either it be a classification, when we try to uh, classify uh, some objects on the images, it can be a cat or dog, or classification and localization tasks where we try to classify objects and then localize this object on the uh, image or kind of object detection, which objects are reside on the image or instance segmentation. All the time we use uh, convolution operation. And this convolution operation helps to achieve our uh, kind of the final um, aim. Uh, and uh, what is this uh, convolution operation and which part consists of it? Uh, one of the most important parts of the convolution operation uh, is the kernel, or also known as the filter. Uh, this kernel is a small matrix, and uh, this small matrix is uh, used to manipulate on the future. Okay, the computer sees the, the pictures. Uh, can, uh, computer cannot see the pictures as we see. And uh, the picture for computer is just the matrix of uh, numbers. And this small matrix kernel is used to, to manipulate this picture somehow. And uh, I know, uh, I think that we, we, at some point of time, we all use Photoshop. And this at the, uh, at the higher level of abstraction, it's kind of same using Photoshop, but uh, with the uh, numbers and codes. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, if you follow these links, you will uh, see some well-known kernels. And uh, for example, if we want to have some blurry pictures, we need a different kind of kernel. If we want to sharpen the edges on the object of this image, we need different kind of kernel, and so on, and so on. Uh, so, um, uh, convolution operation has uh, its dimension, and actually this dimension depends on the dimension of the uh, data. Here we see that uh, this is at the left most part we have uh, our input. Uh, the dimension of this input is one, so we have one dimensional data, and hence what we have uh, in the middle is uh, kernel, 
one dimensional kernel. And this is some random number here for some exposition of pathologies. And uh, to see how the convolution operation uh, works in practice. So at the rightmost side, we have output and uh, applying the uh, kernel uh, and convolution operation is just applying this kernel to this input. So if we apply this kernel to this input, it's just we take uh, element-wise uh, product and after that we sum them uh, this element and we get the, the output. Uh, also note that after the uh, convolution operation, how the size of the output uh, kind of uh, shrinks. Uh, it means that uh, after the convolution operation, we lose some uh, information, and that that's totally acceptable. But uh, if still want to uh, maintain the size of output to be same as the size of input, uh, we can introduce uh, the new notion, new concept of padding, uh, which means to add trailing zeros. Uh, at the left and at the right side. And also note that uh, we used uh, step uh, size one when we applied this kernel to this input. Uh, and uh, what happens if we uh, allow uh, our kernel to slide with the step size two? I mean, here we take this one times two and three times zero, three times one. And what happens if we slide two step, two step at a time and we take uh, uh, this setup, uh, three times two and zero times one and one times one. Uh, here is the uh, example and uh, we introduce here with the, uh, those new uh, notions, uh, as I told you, padding and stride. Uh, padding is, uh, this number shows how many zeros we add at the left and right side and stride is the step, step size or kind of uh, you know how the sliding window works, and this is the same. Uh, this number shows uh, how many steps our kernel will take to uh, evaluate the output. So here, uh, our kernel starts from here to here and then here, and uh, the next uh, second step starts from this tree. The third step starts from uh, zero, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so uh, this is a one-dimensional convolution operation, but uh, this convolution operation is very, very suitable for the uh, one-dimensional data. And uh, this one-dimensional data has one common uh, special dimension with the time, and henceforth this data is called also sequential data. Sequential data is uh, uh, time series data and uh, some uh, text is uh, especially in natural language processing. But uh, one dimensional convolution uh, does not work for images. You know, uh, images have two special dimensions, which is a height and width. And uh, for that reason, uh, we need to have some other, um, some higher dimensional convolution operations. Uh, do we have any questions up to now? Okay, now we can. Am I too fast? Okay, uh, we can continue. Uh, here is the two-dimensional convolution, and uh, two dim okay, take a look just that the, the uh, two-dimensional convolution is uh, to filter the image somehow. Use some kernel to filter the uh, input image. Here is the Geoffrey Hinton's <laughs> picture, and this is uh, uh, our kernel, and this kernel helps us to detect the edges, well, edges of the picture. So this is the output. Uh, we apply this kernel to this input and we will get this output. And uh, here we see that the edges are more sharpened than in original input. And uh, also note that the two dimensional convolution operation, we slide our kernel into directions. Uh, first is uh, left or right, and second is uh, up or down. Uh, okay. Uh, and here, <clears throat> uh, this is kind of the continuation of the previous slides and uh, the logic and intuition are the same. Uh, so we have here some random matrix and some random kernel and the output. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this input uh, is for grayscale images. Okay, grayscale images uh, have uh, uh, widths and heights 
and uh, the depth of these uh, images is one. Henceforth, we have uh, this one matrix, but if we have uh, colored RGB channel images, uh, these colored images have uh, three channels and we will have, or we would have uh, three, uh, three matrix, this kind of three matrix stacked on uh, each other. And uh, uh, I, will, I will show you how the convolution operation works for uh, colored images, but for to make it simple, let's uh, review this example. Here, uh, applying convolution uh, is the same. We take element-wise product and we add them up and uh, we get this output. But uh, to recall the padding operation and stride, <clears throat> here is it. Uh, if we want our output to be the same size as the input, we uh, fill with trailing zeros and we see that the output is the four by four matrix as input was. Uh, and uh, what happens if we uh, move our ML with uh, two steps at a time? And uh, this is the stride of step size two. And stride allows to uh, slide our ML. And uh, this is the first step. After first step, but the, our ML starts with this more matrix, then this matrix, and then this. And we will have this output. Uh, but uh, there is a the, but there is some alternative of stride. If stride is more than one, we can uh, uh, use different uh, kind of technique uh, to effectively reduce the dimension of the output. Okay, uh, so applying a stride uh, more than one uh, means that we effectively reduce uh, the output size. Okay, from here from five to five to uh, two by two matrix we get. Uh, so. Uh, the alternative is uh, to use some uh, type of pooling and in this particular slide we are reviewing uh, in one subtype of pooling which is a maximum pooling. So this is our uh, input matrix or input image and uh, here we have uh, some, it doesn't matter, some kernel and what matter is, matter is the max pooling. How it works? It applies our kernel and picks up only the maximum number from here which is nine in this case, here is the seven, and here is eight, and then six. And we will have this output, which has uh, lower dimensions, I mean uh, height and width. And I think, uh, so now we can see uh, how uh, the convolution works for grayscale images. I have some GIF here, and as you see, this is the uh, input image, which is the grayscale image, and this sliding window is our kernel, and we see how the output is generated. How uh, here is an um, image without a padding and stride equals uh, as we see. Oh, thanks, also. I almost forgot okay. to mention that. Yes, just uh, this is a uh, padding one and stride one, so it starts from here and follows with the step size one and how it will. So, uh, this was the for grayscale images and uh, let's see how it works for three dimension, three channel images, which is a colored image and here it is. Uh, for colored images, we have three channels, red, green and blue. That's how the colored images are built. And uh, this uh, kernel works and <clears throat> produces this output. And actually this is the, how the convolution operation works. Uh, okay, and uh, here is uh, so so mentioned uh, uh, this uh, padding is it, it's not shows up here, but uh, let, let's uh, say this padding is one and stride is one. Okay, uh, so now we can consider how uh, uh, how the convolution operation works for for the whole model, uh, how the model building starts and ends, and how what is this uh, architecture. So, but for this, we need to uh, we need to uh, define why we need a convolution operation and uh, uh, what its role in this convolution neural network. So we use convolution operation to extract features from the images. Okay, let's imagine we have three layer uh, convolution neural neural network. Uh, at the first layer, 
the convolution operation tries to extract the most simple features from the images, uh, such as the vertical lines and edges or horizontal lines. Okay, these are very low level features, just lines and some edges. And in the second layer, uh, the output of the, this first layer is the input for the second layer. And in the second convolution layer, the convolution operation tries to build some mid-level features. Uh, and these mid-level features uh, can be eyes, nose, and ear, depending on the image uh, type. Uh, and after that, the last layer in our imaginary uh, network uh, knows uh, how this, uh, so for the last layer, the input is the output of the second layer, and the last layer already knows uh, where is the nose, eyes, or ears, and uh, where the edges, and then uh, this last layer constructs spatial structure. Okay? So uh, at the high level, the intuition is uh, and key insight is uh, here that the each layer of convolution, convolution uh, is uh, necessary to extract features. And at each level or at each layer, uh, we increase the uh, kernel, uh, the amount of kernel or the number of kernels to extract more and more important features. Okay? Imagine here uh, the number of kernels say is uh, 32, and after that we will we can have 128 or 512. It, it depends on your uh, aim and project or task. Uh, so let's generalize this setup. And if we, if we have, what happens if we have more and more uh, convolutional layers? So the, this picture shows uh, exactly that, what I told you. Here uh, at the start, uh, we, we will have, we have the image, it's a cat, it's the colored image, and uh, here are the three channels. Uh, this, this, this is the first uh, convolutional layer, uh, and uh, here are the channels, uh, uh, here are the channels is the number of kernels, uh, how many kernels we have in this convolutional layer, and it can be, uh, as I told you, uh, 64 or 128, and the uh, then uh, after that we we have second convolutional layer, uh, and uh, at uh, the output of this uh, layer is the input for this layer. And uh, uh, okay, say so that the, the first uh, convolution layer uh, extracts these low level features. Uh, then this second layer extracts uh, these mid level features. After that, with these uh, dashed lines, we can consider here some activation functions, or we can apply max pooling or stride. Uh, it depends. Uh, so this third layer extracts, say, these high-level features, and they already know where the face is located or the object is located generally on the image. And then uh, here also can be, again, the max pooling or average pooling. And at the last part happens uh, the uh, flattening of these matri matrices. These all the input and output of this convolution layer are matrices. And the sizes or, uh, or dimensions of these matrices depends on the uh, number of kernel and also the dimensions of the uh, original input. Uh, so, and uh, this, this is particular case of uh, RGB uh, or colored image and uh, here, uh, and this is for the grayscale image. How the whole model works for grayscale images? Okay, this comes, this uh, image comes from the MNIST dataset. It's um, well known and uh, uh, everyone, I think everyone in computer vision starts with playing with this uh, data set. And uh, here, this is the first hour, first convolution layer. Then it comes max pooling. Here uh, can be in between can be some activation functions, then the second convolution layer, then again the max pooling, and yes, at the uh, last part, here's the flattening. And these green dots and these uh, edges are the uh, uncommon neural networks which is responsible for classification, okay? With MNIST uh, data set, uh, we classify numbers from zero to nine, and this is here we see, and here. Uh, also, this this is some common neural network, and this uh, this uh, neural network is responsible to classify 
an object from the images. In this particular case, we have cave, dog, or car, but this is for picture for cave. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, now we can proceed uh, as we have some uh, general understandings of how the convolution operation works and how it helps us to uh, uh, achieve our aim uh, in uh, complex revision tasks. We can now proceed with uh, how we collected uh, data and how we preprocessed and uh, generated it. <clears throat> uh, in this part, uh, sorry, no, that maybe someone has uh, any questions. So, if someone oh. has questions, okay. okay. Any questions so far? Is it everything clear? I can repeat as many times as necessary. Okay. No. Ah. Good. Um, so, uh, before we uh, deep dive into data generation process and how we collected it up, uh, it's necessary to clearly define, or it's good practice, say this, uh, to uh, clearly define the aim uh, and uh, what task at hand we have and uh, how we approach uh, this task. Uh, so for this task, for our workshop, we have kind of uh, the classification and localization task. First, we try to detect faces uh, on the image <coughs> or on the video, uh, and then we localize those images, and uh, then we, we uh, conduct classification uh, to uh, find if the person or human wears the mask or not. Uh, giving this, uh, as a, also considering that the uh, the images for uh, uh, faces with a uh, mask is somewhat scarce, uh, we decided to use uh, data uh, which was uh, generated somewhat artificially and how this data uh, was generated. Uh, uh, this process consists of the two steps. Uh, the first step is here to uh, collect uh, fa normal faces without uh, masks, so images, I mean, and after that uh, we can apply some computer vision tricks uh, to apply face mask to those uh, faces. So, and what is a uh, trick? Uh, this trick is here to uh, use facial landmark, which automatically detects facial structures, uh, such as mouth, nose, and eyes, and then uh, applies mask. And to understand this process uh, more, more clearly, uh, we can consider this example. Okay, this kind of, this is our starting point. We have this image and then we try to detect the face on this image and then uh, after detection, we apply facial landmark technique and we localize uh, we, and we find out, find out where the nose and uh, mouth is located. After that, uh, we have the picture of mask and we apply those masks to this fa uh, face. Uh, so, uh, applying face detection uh, gives us the ability to compute a uh, face bounding box. This bounding box is the coordinates of the face or the numbers uh, which indicates where the face is located on the image. So as you see, this gives this red box. Uh, and uh, after this, or having the bounding box of the faces, uh, we can uh, use our facial landmarks and localize a facial structure. So this red process indicates or gives uh, us the exact coordinate of the uh, nose and mouth and this. Uh, and uh, now we can apply uh, the mask of this face. Uh, so <coughs> uh, applying mask, and this is the last step, uh, last step, applying masks uh, gives this uh, image. And I know this, this is not the perfect image uh, to have, but uh, this was enough for model training uh, and uh, to generalize well. So, but also note that now uh, using this technique, uh, I mean this data generation process has one drawback, which is that we cannot reuse this image for training process as the image uh, indicating person which uh, does not wear the mask. Okay, 
uh, because uh, if we do so, uh, this will help uh, to degrade our model performance. We will introduce some artificial bias, and our model we will, will not generalize well on the outside the training data. Okay. Uh, so here is this, so, uh, and uh, uh, I think now. Uh, as we uh, have an uh, understanding of uh, how the data is uh, generated, so we can proceed with the uh, model architecture and talk about which model we choose and why we chose this model and uh, uh, how this model is built. Uh, anyway, but before that, uh, maybe I, I cannot see. Is there any questions? Should I see here? No, I think so. I think uh, questions will will go through questions questions at the end. People will write them down in chat or Slack group, and then we can read them. Oh, that's that's much better. Okay, <laughs> that's much better. Thank you. Uh, so, model architecture. Uh, for our workshop, uh, we use uh, model architectures which are mobile nets and. Uh, these mobile nets are highly uh, efficient and optimized for uh, embedded vision applications. Uh, and uh, uh, there are two main types of uh, mobile nets, which are mobile net version one and mobile net version two. Uh, and uh, let me uh, explain to these, to, uh, these two models uh, in uh, details. And uh, so, uh, in contrast to some uh, standard convolution operation, uh, those models use depth-wise uh, separable convolution. And I will explain in detail in a moment uh, what is depth-wise separable convolution. So we see the general architecture, and I will refer uh, those models as V1 and V2. Okay. Uh, so let's start with V1. Uh, mobile net, uh, as I told you, mobile net is a depth-wise convolution uh, operation, uh, separable, uh, separable uh, convolution, and uh, this kind of uh, convolution operation uh, gives us the possibility to dramatically reduce model size uh, and complexity. Now, what is the uh, model size and the uh, model complexity? Uh, smaller model size means fewer number of uh, parameters. We know that the uh, generally, neural networks sense millions of millions of uh, parameters uh, at each layer. Uh, and uh, here, uh, smaller size means fewer uh, model parameters, and the smaller model complexity means uh, a smaller number of uh, operations are conducted at each layer. And uh, this smaller number of operations is uh, uh, multiplication and addition. Okay, now what's the, uh, what is uh, this? The, this uh, a convolution operation uh, does. Uh, so uh, all of considering all of this uh, makes these uh, models so very suitable for mobile phones or devices uh, which has uh, uh, limited computational resources. Mobile, I mean mobile devices or Raspberry Pi or Nvidia Jetson Nano, or we can consider Google's Corel. And um, uh, also, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, what is uh, depth-wise uh, separable convolution? To understand this concept, we uh, I will break down in this into two parts. First is uh, depth-wise convolution, and this is a uh, standard convolution operation. What I was talking about slide pre in previous slides, and uh, this convolution operation is applied on each channel. Uh, okay, imagine we have. Uh, one colored image, and this colored image has three channels, uh, RGB, and this kind of uh, uh, convolution operation is applied on each channel separately, and the outputs are stacked on each other. After that operation comes uh, pointwise, uh, pointwise convolution operation, and this pointwise convolution operation is just a one-dimensional convolution operation uh, and the combination of uh, these two types of uh, convolution gives us a uh, depth-wise separable uh, convolution. So, uh, and what is the difference between those uh, two versions of this mobile net? Uh, V2 version, uh, in contrast to V1 version, has two blocks, as we see, and uh, it, it also uses depth-wise separable convolution operation, but the last layer, 
uh, of uh, this network is linear layer. And why uh, we choose or why uh, uh, the creators of this network chose to uh, have linear uh, layers. At this point, uh, this is the convolution operation here is the depth wise convolution operation with activation of relu and the last layer is a linear layer uh, there are uh, experimental evidences uh, that this at this uh, layer we have small information and if we use non-linear uh, layers such as the relu uh, we lose uh, even too much information then that, that still uh, causes our model uh, performance to degrade and it uh, will not be able to kind of perform classification or object detection tasks. Uh, and um, as uh, uh, this uh, network is uh, highly optimized uh, for uh, limited computational resources, we prefer to use this as our application can be uh, deployed on the mobile uh, phones and uh, use it for uh, live stream videos. And now uh, why this? version 2 is much better than version 1. Compared to version 1, version 2 uh, is much, much faster and uh, uses two times fewer operations. Fewer operations, I mean uh, multiplication and addition and have 30% uh, less parameters. Uh, uh, here are the, uh, the, on the slide, the text what I was talking about here. And let me skip this. And here, there is uh, on this table, there is a comparison of uh, mobile net V1 and mobile net V2 on the ImageNet data set. And they, uh, these two architectures perform image classification tasks. And we see that version one has almost 600 million operations. It needs 600 million operations, while version two needs uh, two times less, almost two times less. And this column shows the number of parameters okay, in millions. Uh, 4.2 million parameters for V1 and 3.4 million parameters for V2. And this first column shows the accuracy. And uh, uh, taking into account uh, the smaller size of version 2, accuracy is higher for version 2 than in, in contrast to version 1. And that's why uh, using more mobile net version 2 is preferred in this case. Uh, so. Uh, is it clear everything here? And uh, now, uh, as we have, uh, as I defined uh, the architecture of the model, and we know how the convolution operation works, and also uh, we know how data is generated. Uh, now it's time to build and train the model. Uh, I uh, pasted some uh, uh, some important uh, parts from our code, and after this presentation, we can review. Uh, the code step by step and you will be able to follow me and uh, uh, to train the model if you want or also we have trained model and you can use uh, this trained model uh, to perform a face mask detection in real time. So but uh, before model training we use the data augmentation technique uh, to have a new training data we are we introduced some random rotation zooming and shifting and flipping the images and uh, here is uh, our base model and base model is defined as mobile net version 2 and uh, we use the uh, weight of pre-trained image net uh, and uh, as i told you in the previous slides here i think this should be up oh, this one uh, the first few layers of convolution operation try to uh, extract most simple uh, low level features and taking into consideration uh, this, uh, this was the reason why we used the uh, pre-trained ImageNet weights, because it's much, much better uh, to use uh, weights coming from this huge data set, uh, then uh, you start your training process from scratch and uh, uh, will not uh, achieve a desired result. Uh, also, uh, we excluded uh, the head layer of this network because we want uh, we want to have our head layer. So the output uh, of this layer will be our uh, model simple. Uh, this is uh, our, our base model and in the next 
slide, we will define our uh, head layer. Okay, and this is how our head layer is defined. Our head layer is the output of the base model, and base model is this one. Okay, uh, and uh, we introduce some uh, layers, some extra layers. And this is the average pooling uh, layer. After this uh, uh, average pooling, uh, we flatten the output of average pooling layer. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the, the, this flattened, uh, the output of this flattened layer uh, will be the input for the dense layer uh, with activation rebel. And after that, we uh, drop some neurons uh, with the probability of 0 0.5. And this is kind of the um, uh, norm regularization technique for our model not to overfit. And after that, after the dropout layer, we have this layer, and we use activation of soft mask to perform classification tasks. Okay, we have two classes, either person wears the mask or the person doesn't wear the mask. And here, this last line uh, is our uh, model, and it's ready to be trained. And also note that uh, for optimization, we introduced Adam is one of the strongest and uh, <clears throat> well adopted uh, optimizer function in this kind of task. Uh, and here comes to model compilation. This is very specific for TensorFlow and Keras. And for uh, this workshop field, TensorFlow and Keras to train the model, but you can uh, give a try and use PyTorch or some fast AI. And uh, if we did not compile the model, it will throw some <coughs> errors. And uh, this is actual frame. This last part, we uh, fit the model, we use uh, our data here. And for epoch, we used uh, 20, uh, sorry, we used uh, 20 epochs uh, to train the model. And uh, that was all the, way next, uh, all the way enough. And uh, uh, so, as we have classification tasks, uh, we can use some common uh, classification metrics to assess model performance and uh, to see if our model overfitted or underfitted or just performed uh, uh, what was expected. Uh, for that, here you see some classification reports and uh, our model achieved uh, approximately 99% accuracy. Uh, and here is also, uh, this graph shows the uh, model training and accuracy. And as long as those uh, two lines uh, follow at each other and uh, does not diverge, we can see that our model uh, does not overfit. It's just good. Uh, so I think uh, this is the very end of our presentation and we now uh, uh, review the code and uh, perform the live demo of our, but uh, before doing that, I want to uh, give you some additional resources and uh, these are some resources uh, which uh, explain even in depth of uh, how this uh, model architecture is uh, um, built and by the way uh, this model comes from google uh, and this is the very end of this uh, presentation any questions or we can continue with the coding part okay and for the coding part let me uh, Yes. Now, uh, this is our uh, workshop structure or the kind of project structure where we use, we have three main uh, files or scripts, and uh, we use uh, this code for model training. And I will briefly uh, overview uh, what was the part of this code. Here we have some uh, general and common imports. And as I told you, we use that Enflow and Keras. Uh, this function is built for uh, argument parsing and uh, you can uh, run those scripts in terminal and this function is used for uh, to parse the uh, arguments typed in terminal. And here this loop is responsible for uh, to find uh, where the images is located uh, and uh, parse them. Uh, and here, uh, here we uh, we create a NumPy array of labels. Labels are uh, one and zero, 
one means that person wear the face mask and zero means that a person doesn't wear the uh, mask. Uh, after that, we perform uh, binarization of those labels and we split our data uh, into two, uh, training uh, and testing. Uh, we use 80% of our data for training purposes and 20% for validation of testing purposes. And uh, this is uh, image generator, as I told you, uh, we use data augmentation technique to have new training data. We are we randomly uh, uh, randomly rotate, uh, shear, uh, and flip the images. And uh, this is uh, the base model, but this base model does not have head layer, as we want to have our uh, new head layer. And this code is responsible to create uh, our new head layer. And the input for our uh, head layer is the uh, output of the base base model. Okay. Uh, then, oh, this uh, also know that this code uh, freezes uh, some layers in the base model. Uh, and after that, happens here uh, the model training, and uh, we also uh, serialize our model for. Uh, this line of code is responsible to serialize uh, our trained model. Serialization means to uh, save the trained model on the disk. Okay, and you see here, this is the uh, saved model. And these lines of code are responsible to, for, uh, for this graph. Okay. Uh, and after the training process, we saved our model on the disk and we can now perform uh, how, it, uh, uh, how it performs on the uh, training set. And for this, we have this script is responsible to test our model on the static images. Uh, and here is the same, this import, and uh, here is the argument after function, this one. Uh, and then we read the images some uh, testing images, and uh, uh, we uh, create uh, image blobs, uh, and this is the input for our model. And uh, then we uh, put our image into our model. Uh, and uh, uh, here, with this for loop, uh, happens the uh, prediction process. First, uh, on the image, our model tries to detect face, and after the face is detected, uh, we perform a uh, mask detection on that face. And uh, that's all. Uh, and uh, now we can uh, continue with the, uh, uh, with the demo to see how our model performs in real videos. And for that reason, I have the notebook here. Okay. And I can run this notebook and uh, see uh, what will be the output. Okay, this is some uh, command to make sure that we are on the um, uh, correct path. I mean, uh, we have all the necessary files. This is our serialized model. Uh, and we will import some, uh, okay, we, we use OpenCV uh, to switch uh, on our camera and perform live streaming. And <clears throat> at this function, uh, it's responsible for uh, detecting face and uh, on the face detect uh, if face has mask or not. Uh, for this reason, uh, we, uh, also know that we have some threshold parameter here. And I will tell you soon what is this uh, threshold. But this first uh, this uh, frame parameter is uh, each frame coming from our uh, live stream video. Okay, a uh, video consists of many, many images which uh, moves very fast. And uh, this uh, algorithm, uh, this parameter is responsible to detect face, and this parameter is responsible to detect if face has mask or not. Uh, here, uh, with this loop, uh, uh, we set some confidence, and this threshold parameter uh, is, uh, okay, our, uh, at the last, last layer, uh, our model returns probabilities. And this probability shows uh, if a face, uh, a face has mask or not. Okay, uh, if probability is high, we are uh, more certain that the face has mask, and uh, if lower, face doesn't have mask. And also, 
uh, we define uh, this confidence and if our confidence or mod model's uh, predicted probability is lower than this threshold, this, this threshold we say that the, uh, this phase uh, does not bear the mask. And one of the most important uh, line of code here is uh, this if condition. If our model did not, uh, could not detect phase on the image, hence uh, the prediction will be uh, has mask or not. And uh, uh, this function returns the location of real phase and the uh, prediction. So uh, this is just function. Uh, we can run it using shift enter works for me. Maybe in some cases control enter uh, work here. And uh, uh, with these lines of code, we read our uh, model, uh, which we serialized here or saved on the disk. And we use uh, some pre-trained uh, weights from Internet uh, for phase detection. And uh, this is uh, our model to detect uh, if phase has a mask or not. Let me run this and I think I my camera is turned off and this will work. And this is the last part. Uh, this line of code uh, turns on uh, my camera and you will see my face. And uh, this while is responsible to read each frame with this live stream. Uh, then resize this frame to match this uh, uh, the uh, sizes of widow, and uh, then uh, then happens uh, the prediction. And if we uh, press the Q uh, on our uh, keyboard, uh, this application will stop. And there's some uh, something up. Okay, let's see how this works. The camera is turned on, I think. Yes, and you will see me here. I'm not wearing the mask. Okay, and it detected face. Uh, as I told you, now let me take my mask and here, and if it, uh, uh, yes, it works. Yeah, yeah, you see how it works. Now that it uh, don't work on a black uh, mask because in the training set we have only white mask. Uh, yeah. Uh. As uh, I found out uh, a couple hours uh, before, there is also a new data set of a uh, much wider mask, so you can train this model on the data set. So. Okay, uh, so we'll see how it works, but I uh, let me check if it works. This is the blue part, and it still sees that it's a, a, a white. Okay, and I think for, for the black mask, it uh, just doesn't work because it uh, don't know how to differentiate and discriminate a um, black or other colors of masks. So I will turn off this video and uh, it will take some time. So I think uh, this is the uh, end of our uh, workshop. Uh, if you will have some questions with uh, the codes, we can. Uh, answer these questions, or you can run uh, this uh, this training and uh, fine tune some parameters to have even better model than we have. Uh, or anything else? Is everything uh, clear, or we can go back to slides? Uh, nice, Russell. Russell told that it works on a great mask. Oh, sorry, I did not. Uh, I, it's wrote in the chat. Uh, uh, we included any tutorials. Uh, this code is uh, part of the tutorials. Um, mm -hmm. So the, we include links, and uh, if something is uh, not clear, you can uh, read those. So they are all past, past before. Yeah, and there is also a tutorial how to do the same uh, on the PyTorch. It's a oh. uh, framework of deep learning as a, as a flow. Uh, as okay. I, as, as far as we know, uh, um, on the data on the data tone, um, uh, you have to build something like that. So, if you have a question, ask us. No problems. And uh, also, I uh, want to add uh, some. The uh, here you see. Oh, 
this. Uh, this is great source for learning. And also this uh, will help you for Datathon uh, to build something cool. And there you will find some notebooks and real world, uh, real life examples, how you uh, use uh, convolutions, uh, especially these notebooks. And this is uh, uh, School of AI. Uh, and uh, our company, Maxim AI, conducts these lectures every week. And also uh, make note that from the next year, we will start our new school and uh, you will, be, you will uh, have a chance uh, to apply for that school. It's totally free. And uh, there are amazing lecturers and amazing people deliver those lessons. And uh, also, most importantly, those lessons are uh, suitable for real world and it's just not textbooks. Okay. Uh, so now can I can I stop sharing the screen, or are there some questions? I think it's a little bit early uh, to finish, but uh, we we were expecting uh, questions. So if anyone has any kind of question, it's be it is best time to ask now. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nodar and Diosep for your presentation. Uh, it was very nice, and thank you for your time and for your effort. Um, if anyone has question, you can write it on uh, Zoom chat or Slack group or Ice Hand. But as we can see, no. Okay. Um, thank you, Iraqli. Thank you all for listening to me and this also, and this was great experience delivering this workshop. Thank so, you. Uh, this is our last session for today and uh, tomorrow we have Datathon, which will be fun, very interesting and many, many surprises are waiting for people there. So uh, do not hesitate to join. Thank you.